know if it's good morning or good afternoon to, to Ohio, but it's a really great uh, to, uh, uh, to see you make the, the national finals. It's really, that in itself is an accomplishment. And the fact that you've done this under our current circumstances uh, is even something uh, more to be proud of. So we're really, really uh, happy uh, uh, to see you. Um, so um, um, I'm Donald Rogers. I teach history at Central Connecticut State uh, University. Um, and I've been involved in We the People for a very long time. It's a great program and you should really be uh, happy to be part of it. And my colleagues are, Un unmute Dan. Unmute. Good morning, I'm Dan Taubman. I'm a senior judge on the Colorado Court of Appeals in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I'm, uh, I congratulate you for winning your state competition and I also have been involved with We the People for a long time and uh, I know we all look forward to hearing your presentation this, this morning. Hello, I'm Dave Adler. I'm president of the Alturas Institute and adjunct law professor at University of Idaho. I've enjoyed judging in the national finals for many, many years, and I'm eager to have a, an enjoyable conversation with all of you today. Congratulations on overcoming adversity uh, to reach this, this high level of competition. Nice to be with you. Thanks. So why don't you introduce each of yourselves and when you do, tell us one thing that you were doing before the virus uh, interrupted our lives. And then at the end, I'll be sure to introduce your teacher. Well, I'm Carlos Zaragoza. I'm a senior. And before the virus, I was really looking forward to track season, but unfortunately it got canceled. I'm Luke Ruel. I'm a junior and I was with Carlos training for track season until it got canceled. Um, I'm Maria Konar. I'm a senior and I was in our school's musical until it got canceled. And your teacher? Your who's your teacher? Um, my teacher is Mr. Dickman. Very good. So I'm very, very proud of you to see you uh, in the national competition. So um, I'm going to read the question to you to refresh our memory what the question is about. You know, it's uh, unit four, question three. Um, and uh, here is the question. Article one, section four of the Constitution provides that state legislatures can determine the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives, yet gives Congress the power to make or alter such regulations. What are the advantages and disadvantages of a uniform election process? And what responsibility do state legislatures, state election officials, and citizens have in maintaining free and fair elections? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the trustee and delegate theories of representation as they apply to congressional districts? Please go ahead. Mr. Chairman. Having everyone follow the same election procedures can provide for a better understanding of the process and a more efficient process for electing office holders. However, the delegates to the Philadelphia Convention had widely different views on voting qualifications, which created an intense debate and allowed the states to undermine voting rights under the Constitution. Having a uniform system, much of the controversy in the 2020 election, such as Iowa's antiquated caucus system, which led to uncertainty and long delays in determining the winner, could have been avoided, which would be advantageous for the voting process. In addition, rather than spreading out the primary elections from February to June, a more concise primary season would have prevented the suspension of the primaries in Georgia, Ohio, and Louisiana due to the coronavirus. However, allowing states to set their own voting methods and qualifications has become problematic when one, pro when one party controls the state emblems of fair policy, such as so as seen with literacy tests, poll taxes, and grandfather clauses in the South until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the ratification of the 20th Amendment. Finally, while the Voting Rights Act of 1965 aimed to create more uniform procedures, the 2013 Supreme Court decision in Shelby County versus Holder severely limited the federal government's ability to regulate voter suppression methods, such as requiring street addresses in North Dakota, which excluded Native Americans from voting in 2018. 
Mr. Chairman, everyone involved in an election from state official to the citizens themselves have a responsibility to take action whenever necessary to maintain free and fair elections. It is important to understand that elections are governed at the state level and voter suppression is caused by state legislators as seen in 2011 when the Texas legislator passed SB 14 requiring a government issued photo ID to vote. In addition, state election officials play a key role in supervising the election process from registration to election to voter security to ballot security as seen in the case of A. Philip Randolph Institute versus Houston, in which Ohio used voter caging to remove voters from poll rolls for failing to vote in an election cycle. With political parties trying to gain any advantage they can in elections, a large responsibility also falls onto the citizens to maintain fair elections. Citizens can make up this responsibility by being attentive to the elections and speaking up on when issues occur, such as the safety of citizens in the case of COVID-19. However, they must also maintain peace and tolerance at the site of the election as a way of protecting other people's rights. Mr. Chairman, both trustee and delegate theories of representation have proven to be advantageous throughout our history. However, there have been a great number of disadvantages that have been found inside of these systems as well. An advantage of these theories of representation include the ability to better understand the will of the people, while a disadvantage could be the misinterpretation of the people's will. In the trustee theory of representation, elected officials make decisions based on their own knowledge and expertise, and the constituents trust their decisions, which gives the office holder the ability to make decisions based on the common good without needing to assess the majority's opinions. However, this method is not democratic and can misrepresent the will of the people. The delegate theory of representation is much different than the trustee system in that representatives work to reflect the views of the majority of what the people want. This system reflects more democratic principles and ensures that the will of the people is more closely followed. Despite these advantages, a disadvantage of this system is that the will of the people is not always easy to identify as seen in recent close elections like the 2016 presidential election in Florida, which was decided by less than 150,000 votes. We're now ready for your follow-ups. Thank you for very much for your nicely uh, organized opening statement. Um, if we look at um, Article 1, Section 4, doesn't that article give Congress very broad powers to regulate elections on the state level? And um, um, how much of a blow to those broad powers was the Shelby case, really? Um, obviously, the Shelby case was addressing an issue that was in Congress. Um, whether or not it was that much of a fatal blow is debatable. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, I mean, um, can you survey the scope of powers that Article I, Section 4 um, allocates to Congress to make or alter election rules on the state level? I mean, does it, how can it regulate time? How can it regulate place? How can it regulate manner? Well, uh, a really, really good example of uh, those regulations would be uh, like currently with the coronavirus, um, Congress was able to regulate the uh, holdings for the elections and due to the health risks, um, even the health department was involved so that the primaries were delayed uh, to not risk anybody becoming infected. Um, I'd like to change the subject a little bit and ask you about the different constitutional amendments that uh, have been uh, ratified that deal with uh, voting. Um, how do, what are some of those amendments and how do they relate to Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution? Well, uh, one amendment would be the 24th Amendment. Um, which states that, uh, no, wait, Lou, can you help me out here? 
Uh, tw the 24th Amendment was put into place so that there could be no poll taxes on, like, when voting was taking place. And this, like, relates to the question because um, it helps to, like, maintain free and fair elections for everybody because some people wouldn't be able to pay those taxes. You, you mentioned in your, in your introductory remarks <clears throat> about the ability of, of Congress to protect voters uh, from voter suppression. I'm wondering, if, as you think about voter suppression or other methods or various methods employed by states to deny voters the opportunity to vote, uh, are there particular groups in our society, racial, age or otherwise that have been the victims of discrimination practiced by states in denying uh, the franchise? Absolutely. I think if you look in the history in the case of like there was literacy tests that were put in place to help prevent African Americans to vote. And also there was a case in Texas regarding, I think I mentioned in my answer regarding photo ID. So I absolutely, I absolutely believe that there is. I absolutely believe that there is groups of people that have discriminated against. Carlos, go ahead. To add on to what my colleague said, the photo IDs almost acted as a poll tax because um, people had to pay uh, to get the ID to vote. So they had to pay state to vote. And also, uh, in my question, I. Um, I mentioned how uh, Native Americans, um, where they lived, they didn't necessarily have a, an address, um, and the address was required to vote in a way suppressing their ability to, to vote. Adding on to what my colleague said, there's evidence that shows that um, polling locations are being put farther away from places like college campuses, where they where it's believed that they'll all vote a certain way or the majority will vote a certain way and it's a form of suppression because most college students do not have cars so they couldn't drive to the polling location and cast their vote and just as a quick follow-up uh, those various kinds of suppression do you believe that they would justify congress exercising its power under article one section four to ensure that there's no discrimination in the ways that you mentioned. You're asking if uh, Congress uh, should use Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution to prevent these? Yes. Yes, of course. Um, like uh, the 15th Amendment states that citizens should have, um, all citizens should have the right to vote uh, regardless of their race, gender, um, yeah. Thank you. That's time. Thank you very much. So we well, thank you for a very organized uh, presentation. Um, we're going to have uh, a few comments for you, uh, some, um, a lot of compliments and a few suggestions. Um, so I, I like the way that you uh, began your presentation uh, talking about the Constitutional Convention and the um, the thoughts the framers had in mind when they were uh, putting this article together. And, uh, and I would like to hear more about this, uh, why, why this was a controversial um, um, a particular clause. Um, and you could have to done that, you could have gone to the Federalist, uh, Federalist 59, 60, and 61. Alexander Hamilton speaks to that, and you could, uh, you could have uh, developed that. Um, I like the way that each of you in turn uh, talked about each of the uh, subparts of the question, uh, the problem of uniformity, and you, I mean, you looked at it both ways. I mean, you don't want too much uniformity, but too, not too much particularism. Um, the uh, responsibilities of state officials for various aspects of the uh, election process, um, the good discussion of the differences between the trustee and delegate um, uh, uh, theories of representation. Um, on my question of, you know, what con powers does Congress have in the Shelby case, I think you had a really big opening that, that you could have, uh, uh, could have exploited there. If you just think of time, one of the first laws that Congress passed 
was to designate that there would be one date on which the national elections would occur, second, first month, uh, no, Tuesday after the first Monday. Tuesday after the first Monday. So, uh, um, and, uh, and, um, and then if you go on to the Shelby case, if you just open that case up and, you know, talk a little bit about what it was about, and this is really under the Voting Rights Act. It basically struck down Congress's, uh, you know, uh, exercise uh, of the Voting Rights Act, Section 4B of being outdated. And that's a pretty narrow basis. And you could have gone on to argue, well, that, you know, affected uh, Congress on the Voting Rights Act, but there's many other ways that Congress still has powers. So that was a real opening uh, that, that you, you could have, uh, have exploited. Um, I thought you, in answer to one of the other judges, I thought you um, came back with a good answer, uh, uh, listing ways that certain groups have been disfranchised or you know, harmed uh, within the electoral process. So you uh, had a good feel there. So, so some really strong points and some places where you could grow. And, uh, but overall, I thought a nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Professor Rogers. I think you covered all of the different parts of the question. Um, I like the, your reference in your opening statement to the Shelby County uh, case, and in particular, your examples of the Texas and Ohio laws that were in, uh, enacted uh, after Shelby County was decided that had the effect of restricting uh, voting rights. Um, uh, when I asked you a question about the constitutional amendments concerning voting, um, you mentioned um, the 24th Amendment about poll taxes, but I would have liked to have heard uh, mention of uh, other amendments that have had important effects on making the right to vote uh, more available to people, like the 19th Amendment involving the right to vote for women, um, and uh, the 26th Amendment making the right to vote available uh, for 18 year olds. Um, and uh, so I think that would have uh, strengthened your presentation. Um, I agree with Professor Rogers that your examples of discrimination were good, uh, particularly your example of uh, Native Americans being discriminated by uh, the restriction in uh, polling places. And so overall, I think you did a nice job. Thank you. I, I want to share the views of my colleagues. I, I, I agree that your introduction was very well organized. You are articulate. Uh, you cover a lot of ground. Uh, and, and I think your answer uh, to the question I ask about forms of discrimination uh, was particularly impressive. I was hoping at that point you, you might have said that these uh, provide, these forms of discrimination uh, would provide a strong justification and maybe the necessity for Congress to act boldly in light of the uh, November election and the possibility that it will be held in the midst of the COVID virus. You alluded to that earlier, that that could have been an opportunity for you to be very assertive, but nevertheless, you, you handled that question very nicely. I also agree that in shaping your uh, introduction once you mention the Constitutional Convention, it would be good to provide the reasons, maybe some of the factors, concerns that uh, impelled the framers to craft this clause in the first place. But I, I was very impressed with, with your work. It was really a job well done. I congratulate you uh, and wish you the best of luck. Would I, would I be in good position to say, go Buckeyes? <laughs> Good. Let's give were, the teacher. Uh, I mean, the teacher supported yeah. this good group of students. They give the teacher uh, applause. Yep. So, congratulations.